This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was unformed and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio. And I thank all of you for taking the time to join us this evening. I do have a very interesting show, as always, lined up for you, where it will be a follow-up on what we discussed last week with regard to the courses of the heavenly luminaries and how it is that the cosmology was established by the Most High God and what the true depiction of the biblical geocentric universe really looks like in comparison to what we are told and what we are indoctrinated into with regard to uh, mainstream education. And so those of you that have really looked at and examined this particular issue, you know that it is one of the largest when it comes to paradigm shift uh, and comes to understanding the world it's unfathomable as far as being able to really grasp it and then once you make sense of it, then understand where you are. And also, um, as far as what we thought of where we were with regard to God and an ever-expanding universe and all these other possible races and peoples and stars and planetary systems and even the possibility of ancient alien and extraterrestrial life and people haven't been evolved millions of years in advance of our own and so once you know the truth of that we are really the only show in town and the only game in town and that everything centers here upon the earth. There are no other earth-like planets. There are no other, um, as far as worlds and unfoldings going on out there. and understanding that it really it makes it gives you a very intimate sense of where we are in regard to the creator and that he truly is narrowly focused on the earth and us as humans being made in his image that we are the focus, the apple of his eye. We are the the bride, and we are the, we're special. We're very special in regard to the creation, and we, everything as far as prophecy and all that is connected to it, we have part in, and God has told us the end from the beginning. He's revealed in his scriptures, in his creation, on every level, from the macro to the micro. He reveals himself in all things, which shows also that in everything, the fingerprints of the Most High are easily observable. And he has imprinted himself 
on every aspect of the creation. That the Godhead is present in from those things which are invisible to those things that from a microscopic to a macroscopic scale. Um, e even though we've been lied to with regard to a lot of it, just what we are able to see, just what we are able to witness of the creation, looking out at the grand scale of what we daily see as the unfolding of every new dream with the sun rising, crossing the skies, the cycle of spring, summer, fall, winter, day and night, uh, twilight, the transition in between. All these things and the way that everything grows, and the harvest comes in and, and then everything begins to shed its leaves in preparation for fall and winter and then we have the the winter cold and the winter rest and how all of that is dependent upon the movement of the sun back and forth between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer and how that movement also generates the fluctuation of temperature and the air masses and that that temperature the sun interaction with the earth and also with the oceans the creation of condensation evaporation the storm the cyclical storm cycles and patterns hurricane tornadoes all of those things that all of that creates the weather patterns and the movements of the seasons and the differentiation between spring, summer, fall, and winter for the northern and southern latitudes. Those people that live on what is the inner circle of the plane of the earth and those that live on the outer rim that the equidistant mean, the equator, and the circle that divides the Earth's plane into two separate portions, that our seasons are opposite because of the transit and this back and forth movement of the sun and the other luminaries as they cycle back and forth through these six gates of heaven that Enoch speaks about. And so this evening, I'm going to expound upon that a little bit more to try to help you to grasp in greater clarity as far as the, the movements of the heavenly luminaries and also how it is that these movements create the clockwork mechanism of time and the passing of it. And once you understand this, as far as how God has established the observance and the, as far as being able to mark with calendar, the passing of time, one can really make sense of how it is that all of the different aspects of it, the days, the weeks, the months, the years, and what is also called the great cycle, that of the procession of the equinoxes, these cycles that God has established all of these patterns in rhythm and in synchronicity with each other in order to help humanity 
and history to keep up with what is the unfolding of the different eras of time. And it is this calendar system also which helps us to make sense of where we are in the grander scheme of things. Because God has established this second world age over what will be the, what is now the unfolding of the last 6,000 years of history. And that at the end of this 6,000 year, this 120 Jubilee cycle, we have what is the coming of the millennial reign. And that the millennial reign represents the cycle of seven days that God established the creation. And that each one of these days, a day is, has a thousand years according to scripture. And so God reveals through the scriptures that this pattern, this cycle of 7,000 years for the second world age, that it will unfold with this 6,000 years of duality and then what will be the millennial rest, which will restore to some degree a semblance of normality and a return to paradise and what will be our former estate. That Adam and Eve were created in paradise before they fell and before they were exiled, banished here to the earth, they um, lived in perpetual bliss. And that humanity will return to that state after these 7,000 years or these seven days. And Enoch speaks about this in the scriptures as being the eighth day and that on the eighth day we will return to an eternal age and that there will be no need for the counting of time and that we will return to a time when the lion will lay down with the lamb the child will play with the viper um, there will be no more death, no more hell, no more evil, no more devil, no more suffering, no more aging. For the former things will have passed away. But until we reach that time, it's important for us to understand the cycles and these patterns as established by God and as revealed to Enoch by the angel Uriel. And that if we can make sense of the true nature of the biblical cosmology, one can then understand the deeper aspects of what we see as the calendar system and the creation and the different levels and how it is that the earth is the conjunction, the meeting place, the proving grounds for what is the spirit, spiritual and material worlds, that it is here in this dualistic, duplicitous world that we learn through the knowledge of good and evil, but that this is only for short time. And so 
I want to expound upon this a little bit to better enable you and those of you that are interested in these concepts and that also want to follow the true Sabbath and honor the true Levitical feast days that we have made it easy for you to do so. We created what is called the Enochian seasonal lunisolar calendar. And it's based upon what I learned in 2015 when the Most High led me to understand the biblical geocentric cosmology and the way that the circle of the earth was inscribed upon the waters of the deep and being enclosed by the solid structure of the Barakia, the firmament, that the luminaries were placed into it on the fourth day and established in their tabernacles. And that these tabernacles regulate what are the revolutions of the luminaries around Polaris as the center, the pivot for what is all of the other hosts, the celestial hosts, the angelic, starry, wandering stars, heavenly luminaries that whereas we think that the planets move in circle around the sun, the sun with all of the other luminaries moves in circle around Polaris. And Polaris is the one star that does not move, has no motion, and remaining fixed for thousands of years, it is the one star which the navigators and uh, different individuals, shipmasters that looking for Polaris in the evening sky and understanding how the zodiac and the constellations are laid out and move and circle around it, they are able to determine which direction is north. Because the North Star, Polaris, it tells us where the center of the vaulted dome is, where the North Pole is, where the Mount of the Congregation is established, where God's heavenly temple and throne room are. And because we know everything moves in worship and bows down in worship to the Most High God, this is where the heavenly kingdom resides. And so God lives truly in these sides of the north. And sitting upon the center of the vaulted dome, that it is from there that he peers down watches over and looks upon all of the activities unfolding here upon the earth. And really there's no other place, no other occurrences, no other happenings for him to monitor or keep up with. There's nothing else going on. He made the earth, all of the creatures, and humanity in his own image that we are the apple of his eye. We are his narrow focus. There's no other galaxies or peoples or planetary star systems or suns and binary star groups and Yada, 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 all that. None of that is happening. There's nothing else 
but what we see reflected in our creation. And our creation is the fullness of all that is. The stars are not suns. The sun is not a star. Uh, the moon is completely something different as well. The sun and the moon are the two great luminaries established for, as it says, for the tracking and the keeping up with and the determination of time and the seasons. I'll read it for you. But I know that a lot of people now are interested in and are looking into examining to know more about where we are and who we are. Okay, and the Lord said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to distinguish between the day and the night and let them be for signs and for festival times, and for the numbering by them the account of days, and for the sanctifying of the beginning of the months, the beginning of the years, and the passing away of the months and the passing away of the years, the revolutions of the sun, the birth of the moon, and the revolvings of the seasons. And so, both the sun and the moon were established in order to give us and establish the calendar. It's not one or the other, but it's both in how they work together. And so I know I've covered this in great detail, but since so many people are now beginning to examine this issue and to look into this topic and to give it serious consideration um i will every now and then revisit because i believe that this teaching and this revelation as shared by myself and so many others now that for those that don't know the the international flat earth conference in canada is going on right now and that you know a lot of those that have put themselves on the forefront of for really opening oneself to ridicule that bringing forth this truth it has even though we know and those of us that studied it know it to be without a doubt a huge paradigm shifting revelation most of the world won't even consider it as possibility and most of the world being so indoctrinated into the matrix of illusion and buying into the whole globe deception they consider it ludicrous to even challenge in supposition that the earth is not a globe when it's clear even from the properties of water that water could in no way adhere to a ball. It must always at all times be contained within a basin and be gathered and collected in a manner where it will pull and pooling together it will always settle without question that the whole suggestion that the earth is a globe or has spherical shape and that there are mountains of water gathered in curvature is insanity. 
All right, we'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, and so I had mentioned that we had created the Enochian seasonal lunar calendar. And also, uh, I want to thank, uh, I forget exactly who it was that contacted me and let me know that I needed to update January and February of the seasonal calendar in order to reflect the movement into what would be 2019 and tw not 2017. And so uh, for those that did purchase the calendar earlier, um, I did update and correct the last two months because I uh, we had created first the calendar situated in the way that the Gregorian was established from January to December. And when we shifted it to March to February, uh, it didn't update for what would be the next two months in congruency with, um, you know, from March 2018 to February 2019. For some reason, it instead just put January, February, according to what the 2017 uh, calendar was, but all, all of that has been fixed. And so anyways, according to the calendar that we have, and it lists and has the, the dates for all of the Hebrew months. And so, and it also is aligned to the weeks and the Sabbaths are broken down and aligned to the phases of the moon, which if you understand that, you know, the great luminary and the lesser luminary, the sun and the moon and the way that they unfold and pattern, they regulate the days, the weeks and the months, but that Specifically, the Sabbaths are connected to the phases, the quarterly phases of the moon, and that the lunar months also establish what are the patterns for the determining the Levitical feast days and the celebrations thereof. Because in the month of Nisan and also the month of Tishri, which are the first and the seventh month, according to the Hebrew calendar, the month of Nisan occurring usually in March on the Gregorian calendar, and Tishri in September or October, um, depending on how it, you know, unfolds, because the Gregorian uh, is completely misaligned to and broken away from what are the luminaries, the heavenly luminaries and the cycles and the patterns of their unfolding. And so true Sabbath being aligned to the appearance of the waxing crescent moon, that being the first day on the lunar calendar, the lunar month, and then the next four seven day Sabbath weeks are connected to then the first quarter moon is the first Sabbath, the full moon is the second Sabbath, the third quarter moon is the third Sabbath, and the lunar conjunctive moon, the fourth Sabbath. This makes it so that every Passover and the celebration uh, on the 15th of Nisan, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that always occurs near a full moon, which begins on the 15th of Tishri. Um, it always also begins on and near a full moon. And it's a seven day festival, the festival of um, Passover week and also of Tabernacle week, the week of Tabernacles. 
it begins on a full moon and commences, I mean, uh, ends, it commences on a full moon and ends on the third quarter conjunctive um, moon. I mean, the third quarter, the, you know, third quarter Sabbath moon. And so every time we celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and also the Feast of Tabernacles on the 15th. The, the reason they are a Sabbath is because the first day, the waxing crescent, when it appears, that day is excluded from the other four seven days sabbatical weeks. And so that means that Sabbath falls every lunar month on the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd and the 29th. And so no matter if you are following the correct calendar and you are aligning your Sabbath according to the lunar phases, then you understand that every time you celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread and as well as the Feast of Tabernacles, that it will occur on the 15th day, which is always a Sabbath, according to the lunar calendar. And it's only according to the lunar solar calendar, the Enochian lunar solar calendar, uh, of which I will place a link to it. You can find it at sacredwordpublishing.net. Um, but I'll post a link in the chat room for those of you that are interested. to this calendar so you can check it out for yourself. And in doing so, and we make it available on our website for those that want to keep up with and look at and understand how the calendar works. Hold on one second. And so if you visit daily sacredwordpublishing.net, you can keep up with the days, the Hebrew months, all of that, and the way that they unfold. And you can learn the different, as far as the calendar, the Hebrew months. Um, and I, I, th I think it's a really cool thing because it's, what God intended for us. And it's really, if you understand it and you follow it, it's the way that the seasons truly progress from spring, summer, fall, winter, not in the middle of January, you know? Okay, here's a link to the calendar. I'll post it in the chat room. Hello, Regla. Good to see you, sister. All right, I'm, oh, I've got to post this in the Discord as well, sure. Uh, and then I will explain this a little bit more and help you to better visualize, but it was on the 12th of August, just recently, it was on the the past Sunday, that Rosh Kadesh for the month of Elu, which is the sixth month of the Hebrew calendar. And according to the calendar that we've placed and put out, this is the 6,000th and first. And the only reason I, I think we're in the 6,000th and first year is because um, Because it was my opinion that last year, the 2017, was a jubilee year, and that it was the 50th jubilee. No, the 120th jubilee, sorry. And that would make it the 6,000th year. All right. And so, according to the calendar, 
the Christians will actually be correct for the next four weeks and Sabbath will actually fall on Sunday. That the first quarter Sabbath will be on the 19th, which is actually my birthday, interestingly enough. And then on the 26th uh, will be the full moon Sabbath. And then we have on the 2nd of September, the third quarter Sabbath. And then on the 9th of September, the lunar conjunctive Sabbath. And then we will have a 30th day of Elui, which will be on the Monday, September 10th. And then, interestingly enough, on September 11th, you the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Kadesh Tishri, which will be the seventh month of the 6,001st year. So September 11th, we have the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Terah, and then on the 20th of September, uh, Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, is the 10th of Tishri. And on the 22nd of September will be the Autumnal Equinox. And then on the 25th of September, we will have Sukkot the Feast of Tabernacles on the 15th of Tishri, which is also a full moon Sabbath. All right, so hopefully at least you have those dates down and you'll be able to get all of the, you know, the fall feast, the celebration of the fall feast correctly aligned and you'll be able to celebrate these upcoming events because this is going to be an exciting time it will be the uh, God always has the spring and the fall harvest uh, recognition of the spring and also the summer harvest with Pentecost and uh, Shavuot that you know, this is built into God's calendar system which is why he celebrates the beginning of spring in Nisan and also the beginning of fall in Tishri. Also, I want to make, um, it is my belief that no matter where you are on the plane of the earth, that you should celebrate and align your calendar days and your calendars and your Sabbath, according to the movements of the luminaries where you are. Meaning that those that live in southern latitudes, I believe your calendar should be the opposite of what we see in the northern latitudes. Because when, according to you know Enoch's calculations and the way that he talks about the movement of the sun, when the sun crosses the equator for the vernal equinox, when it's on the equator and it begins to move into northern latitudes, this is what creates spring and summer for us. But for those of you that are living in southern latitudes, like in Brazil and South Africa and Australia, that is actually the beginning of your fall. And so in my opinion, Whereas we're celebrating Nissan and the beginning of spring, you should be celebrating Tishri and the beginning of your fall. And the harvests are what are also aligned to the calendar system. And your harvests and your seasons are opposite of ours. And so in order for you to celebrate in Southern latitudes, for instance, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Day of First Fruits, your barley has to be in season. 
And because your seasons are opposite of us, that's why I believe you should be celebrating Nissan when we celebrate fall. When your spring is beginning and your uh, barley crops are starting to come into season, that this should be when you celebrate Passover and unleavened bread and and uh, just my opinion, because you know it's it's the luminaries that set the seasons for the different portions of the earth and the different peoples that live upon the earth. And just because you know the uh, just because the Jews celebrated on one day. Um, even Kadesh could be slightly different for people according to where you are. And I don't think you should celebrate it just because somebody celebrates it at a particular time somewhere else, but that you should celebrate it according to how it unfolds in your skies, according to the, the luminaries and their movement and their unfolding where you are because that's how the calendar will be correct for you and another thing with regard to our Enochian seasonal calendar that I have set it up for where I am here on the East Coast United States of America and that I determine the appearance of the waxing crescent moon according to where I live here in Athens, Georgia. And so if you live in China or Australia or Brazil or somewhere else, you have to gauge the appearance of Kadesh according to where you are. And then having done so, you can see if it aligns to the calendar as we have it laid out in you know in this print copy but that you have to fine tune it according to the unfolding of and the appearance of the waxing crescent where you are and where you live and that you can fine tune it that way and whereas we had like I said, the appearance of the waxing crescent moon here in Atlanta, Rosh Kadesh, for the month, the sixth month of the Hebrew calendar, Elui, E L U I, that it could possibly be the 13th or maybe even the 11th for, for you, wherever you may be. And so if that, if it, uh, if uh, Rosh Kadesh occurs for you on the 13th, well then, of course, you're going to have to shift your Sabbath one day according to that sighting. And whereas for us, it happened on the 12th, and then therefore the next four so Sabbaths will be on Sunday, the 19th, the 26th, and the 2nd and the 9th of September, as I stated, if your waxing crescent appears on the 13th, well, then that would be the 20th, the 27th, and the 3rd and the 10th for you, wherever you may be. And so, yes, we try to make it simple for you to follow the calendar and to understand it, but still you have a responsibility for determining Kadesh wherever you are, citing it, watching it, looking for it. And when you see it, then you can set according to its appearance, then the four quarterly uh, Sabbaths as they link up with the phases of the moon. And the Sabbath will always link up and follow along with the phases of the moon as long as you are following the correct calendar.
and I'll go into some of that um, with the portion of the Book of Enoch on the lesser luminary. Actually, I guess I should forward to that right now. Okay. In this is chapter 21 of my book, Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch. This portion is on the Lesser Luminary, which the first portion is about the calendar and the pagan days of the week and the names of the, you know, the days and the months and how they all receive pagan names, but that the Hebrews do not honor these pagan names for the days of the week or of the months. Um, and so I talk about how it was that, you know, we got deceived into accepting and following the Gregorian calendar and how it was that because the Gregorian calendar is divorced from the movements of the, the moon, that you cannot keep track of Sabbath according to its um, basically all the weeks being run together and that there's no whereas in ancient times and with the use of ancient calendars they all had as for Kadesh an exclusion from the seven day count of the Sabbath weeks. Kadesh was always the first day of the lunar month, and then you had the four seven-day weeks following Kadesh. But because the Gregorian calendar makes no exclusion for Kadesh and doesn't earmark it as so, it just runs all the weeks together, um, that's why the Sabbaths are off. And those of you that follow the Gregorian calendar and that use it to celebrate Sabbath, well, only one in seven times are you actually correct according to the passing and the observance of it. Like, for instance, this, you know, since the sighting of the Waxen Crescent on the 12th, of August, for the next four weeks, the Christians will actually be correct in celebrating Sabbath on Sunday. But then after that, um, because Kadesh for the month of Tishri will occur on September 11th, which will be a Tuesday, then Sabbath for next month will all fall on Tuesday. And, you know, a lot of people say that this is confusing, but really it's not at all when you understand that everything is connected to the movement of the moon, the phases of the moon. And so really what is confusing is trying to keep up with Sabbath when you don't have a calendar, because there's no way for you to maintain using anything in the heavens to understand when Sabbath occurs, according to the Gregorian calendar. But when you're following the Enochian calendar, you look up and you see the moon is, you know, it first appears, well, then you know every seven days thereafter that there will be a Sabbath. And that Sabbath will align to the first quarter, full, third quarter, and lunar conjunctive moons. All right, we'll be right back for a second hour. All right, welcome back, everybody, for second hour. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio. And I just want to, again, thank all of you for taking the time to join us this evening. Uh, also know that we will be doing on September 2nd, which will be the third quarter Sabbath, a Q&A session at our Discord group. And so I did post a link to that in the chat room, and 
for those that would like to join us that listen to the archives or hear the live show later, you can go to my Facebook page, Zen Garcia, and see a link in the show description. And that we will be doing a monthly Q&A show with the listening audience and allowing those of you that are interested in sharing commentary or asking questions to come on directly with us and to speak with us in that manner as well. Also, I'm going to try to remember to, um, in the last 15 minutes or so, to open up the phone lines, and if you would like to call in to share, comment, or ask questions, that I will, uh, you know, try to remember to incorporate that into the show. I know that I always have a lot of information that I want to share, um, and that I often you know, don't even have time to do that, but uh, I do want to give you all a chance to, you know, come on to the show as well, if, should you wish to, and if you have something that you'd like to say, or if you have something that you'd like to ask, that I give you the opportunity to do so. And so, let's go ahead and go back into the text as far as the Book of Enoch, as I said, chapter 21 of the Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch. It is in this book that I break down all 14 chapters of the Book of Enoch's book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries and explaining it according to the what God showed me as far as what Enoch was shown by the angel Uriel that the motions he describes of the luminaries moving from east to west and then north to east, that he was looking down upon what was the backdrop of the circle of the earth, um, and he was seeing the motions of the luminaries as they move in circle around Polaris, which is exactly what their movements are when you're peering down from what would be the North Pole, which again is, you know, where God's heavenly throne room is located. And so Enoch was taken up to where, you know, Polaris was or where God's throne is located. And then he was shown by the angel Uriel the movements of the sun, the moon, and the other stars and the zodiacs. And he explains in the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries the exact detail of these motions. And he also explains them in the second book of Enoch. And even though, in my opinion, the translator of that text tried to place a heliocentric slant upon it, they were unable to um, to muddle Enoch's explanations or Enoch's descriptions of these motions. And what is revealed in the first book of Enoch is also encoded and revealed in the second book as well. It's just that there are some things that I believe... Um, the translator, because he's indoctrinated into, you know, the belief in a globe and the earth having a 365 and a quarter day uh, cycle, that these kind of tendencies are placed upon the interpretations of Enoch's original descriptions. And so it is slightly tainted. And I explain this in my descriptions of uh, both books, because I do cover in great detail both, both accounts in the work that I've done on the Flat Earth, Firmament, and Paradise Sides of the North trilogy. All right. Enoch 7143 says, The lengthening of the day and the night and the contraction of the day and night are made to differ from each other by the progress of the sun. 
this, as I explained, is what happens when the sun moves back and forth between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer. That when it crosses the equator and begins moving into northern latitudes, what we call northern latitudes, which are more the inner circle towards the North Pole, what would be the bullseye area of the flat earth plane if you were looking at it like if it was a dartboard. And then those people that live on the southern latitudes or the outer circle, uh, Australia, Brazil, and Africa, that you guys live more near the edges of what would be the plate of the earth or the outer rim of the, you know, the dartboard. And so anyway, so when the uh, sun is moving across the equator and moving towards the interior, at, towards the North Pole, this is what creates spring for us. And then when it reaches the Tropic of Cancer and begins moving in the opposite direction, that's what creates summer for us. But because it's far, far away from y'all uh, in southern latitudes, that is your fall and your winter. And so the opposite is true for us when the sun leaving and returning southward, or what we call southward, uh, which would actually be moving towards the outer circle, and, and once it reaches the equator again and crosses into southern latitudes or the outer portion of the dartboard or the earth as a clock space, that's what creates fall and winter for us, but spring and summer for you. So every day, no matter which direction the sun is moving, the day and the night are lengthening or shortening according to its motion, which is what Enoch says here. By means of this progress, the day is daily lengthened and the night greatly shortened. This is the law and progress of the sun and it's turning when it turns back, turning during 60 days and going forth. This is the great everlasting luminary, that which he names the sun forever and ever. And thus it goes in and out, neither slackening nor resting, but running on its chariot by day and by night. It shines with the seventh portion of light from the moon, but the dimensions of both are equal. So Enoch tells you that even though the sun is brighter, seven times brighter than the moon, it is exactly the same size. It has the same dimensions as the moon, which is exactly what we see in the sky, which is, you know, why we have also, you know, these, um, the eclipses, if they are indeed caused by the overlap of these two luminaries, that they are equal in measure. Um, like in the Vedic cosmology, two bodies, these dark objects called Rahu and Ketu, that are cited as being responsible for the eclipses. And so, continuing, Enoch 77.3, he says, these are the two great luminaries whose orbs are as the orbs of heaven, and the dimensions of both are equal. And so, there again, Enoch mentions twice that the orb of the sun and the moon are exactly equal in measure. I'm going to skip down. Okay. In chapter 25, I go into explaining the moon and its connections to what are the lunar calendar and how it, it was established and it, how it is revealed. In chapter 72 and forward, that uh, Enoch 
specifies two separate calendars, the solar calendar and the lunar calendar, and how they mesh together to create what is the lunar solar calendar. And that you have to take both into consideration when you are measuring the different aspects of the months, the days, the weeks, and the years that the sun and its motion through the six gates of heaven create the 24 hour days as well as a 364 day year, according to Enoch. That it takes 30 days for the sun to move through each of the six gates of heaven. And then you have the two solstices and the two equinoxes where it either reverses course and begins to move in the opposite direction or it takes a full day to cross over the the equator after this law I beheld another law of an inferior luminary the name of which is the moon and the orb of which is as the orb of heaven Its chariot, which it secretly ascends, the wind blows and light is given to it by measure. Every month at its exit and entrance, it becomes changed, and its periods are as the periods of the sun. And when in like manner its light is to exist, its light is a seventh portion from the light of the sun. Thus it rises and at its commencement towards the east goes forth for 30 days. At that time, it appears and becomes to you the beginning of the month. So here, Enoch is telling us that when it begins to move eastward and it first becomes visible, because the moon will begin to, um, it, it moves with the sun when it's in its lunar conjunctive phase. And so it's, rises with the sun, crosses the sky with the sun, and sets with the sun, but then will begin to depart. And after one day, it lags every day 50 minutes behind the sun and will go through a seventh portion of its light. And so from lunar conjunction to full moon, it takes the moon 15 days to go from being completely void of light to being completely full of light, and then vice versa. It takes another 14 days for it to lose its light completely. But when it makes its first appearance as a one-seventh portion of light, um, that that is the beginning of the month, he tells us right here. And so the waxing crescent, according to Enoch, is the beginning of the lunar months. This is Enoch chapter 72, verse 5. At that time, it appears and becomes to you the beginning of the month. Thirty days it is with the sun in the gate from which the sun goes forth. Half of it is in extent seven portions, one half. And the whole of its orb is void of light, except a seventh portion out of the 14 portions of its light. And in a day, it receives a seventh portion or half that portion of its light. Its light is by sevens, by one portion, and by the half of a portion, it sets with the sun. And so here it's telling you that the moon gains light by a seventh portion every day. And so that's why it takes seven days for it to become one quarter, a quarter moon. And then in another seven days, it becomes a full moon. And then seven more days, it loses, it becomes half dark. That's third quarter moon. And then in another seven days, it becomes completely dark. And that's the dark moon or the lunar conjunctive moon and it becomes completely void of light at that time and so the moon its phases are by 
a seventh portion. And every seven days, it changes quarterly phase, which is exactly uh, why the God has established its quarterly phases to line up with the Sabbaths. And so its appearance as a waxing crescent informs us that the beginning of the lunar month and then each of its quarterly phases tells us when the Sabbath. And when the sun rises, the moon rises with it, receiving half a portion of light. On that night, when it commences its period previously to the day of the month, the moon sets with the sun. The only time the moon sets with the sun is during lunar conjunction, dark moon, when, it, when you can't see it. As I said, it rises with the sun, moves with the sun, and then um, sets with the sun. And then the following day, it lags behind 50 minutes and becomes first visible as a waxing crescent. That is the beginning of the month, according to Enoch. Continuing, Enoch chapter 72, verse 9. And on that night, it is dark in its 14 portions, meaning that the moon is completely void of light. That is in portion precisely, and in its progress declines from the rising of the sun. This is exactly what the moon does when it becomes a waxing crescent moon. It lags 50 minutes behind the sun and will appear for the very first time in the western skies as the sun is setting. And it will become visible for a very short time, and then it will follow the sun as it sets. And then it will not be seen until the following day at sunset. When the sun sets, then you'll see the waxing crescent, and it will be, instead of one-seventh portion full, it will be two-sevenths of a portion full until, you know, it reaches quarter moon and then on to full moon, and then it will start to turn dark and become third quarter moon and, and then uh, full moon. And that's the way the phases work for the, uh, for the moon. Enoch 72.10. During the remainder of its period, its light increases to 14 portions. Then I saw another progress in regulation, which he effected in the law of the moon, the progress of the moons. And everything relating to them, Uriel showed me the holy angel who conducted them all. Their stations I wrote down as he showed them to me. I wrote down their months as they occur and the appearance of their light until it is completed in 15 days. In each of its two seven portions, in each of its two seven portions, it completes all its light at rising and... And so I, I write a great detail of all of these, how the, you know, the phases occur, um, all of that in great detail in the commentary on these chapters, but I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to read that. Uh, I'll continue. I'll skip down to Enoch 73. Thus I beheld their stations as according to the fixed order of the months the sun rises and sets. At those times there is an excess of 30 days belonging to the sun in five years. All the days belonging to each year of the five years when completed amounted 364 days. And to the sun and stars belong six days, six days in each of the five years, thus 30 days belonging to them. So that the moon has 30 days less than the sun and stars. Now, what this is talking about is that the lunar calendar when you multiply it 12, you know, 12 um, months 
times the 29.531 days that is the average of every month, you find out that this equals 354 days. And so over uh, three years, the lunar year is 10 days each year short, 354 days of, to the solar year, which is 364 days. And so each year, the lunar calendar is 10 days short. So after three years, what the Hebrews do to intercalculate the lunar calendar with the solar calendar is they add a 13th month, Adar 2. And so every third year or so, for what is called the metatonic cycle, the Hebrews add this intercalculated year, I mean month, to the lunar year, and then it realigns the barley festivals and also Passover uh, to the solar calendar. And the lunar and the solar calendar then become synced up, which is, is it's an extraordinary, easy uh, thing to do when you really consider and keep up with how the two calendars um, you know, uh, sync up in in unfolding. It's really remarkable, and it's a incredibly beautifully, simply, and complex way that the Most High God has established these two calendar systems to work interrelated one to another, um, and to just every three years or so have to add a 13th month. I mean, that's pretty ingenious. That's a very simple fix uh, for keeping the two calendar systems in alignment with one another. I mean, beautifully simplistic in my opinion. Enoch 73.13, the moon brings on all the years exactly that their stations may come neither two forwards nor two backwards a single day, but that the years may be changed with correct precision in 364 days. In three years, the days are 1,092, in five years, they are 1,800, and 20, and in eight years, 2,912 days. So when you divide all those by 364, that gives you the exact amount of days that Enoch describes for those particular periods of time. Three years is 1,092 days. Five years, 1,820. Uh, eight years, 2,912. All right, we'll be right back for final sentence. All right, welcome back, everybody, for final segment. And so you see that at the very end of the portion on the Lesser Luminary here in the Book of Enoch, it tells you about how the lunar and the solar calendar sync up and how it is that the way that the Hebrews, when they used to follow the lunar calendar, how they intercalculated and synchronized you know uh, every third year or so because the lunar calendar was 10 days short of the solar calendar they would add this second adar adar number two uh, the, a 13th month to the lunar calendar and then it would bring into regulation the barley Feast and the harvest and the crops, so that when Passover occurred, the barley crop would be in season. And so 
which is important because if you're going to have uh, the barley wave offering, the sheaf offering by the high priest on the the day of first fruits, the 16th of Nisan, the barley crop has to be ready for what would be the new harvest. And see, the Hebrew people, they never partook of the new harvest until the sheaf offering. And it was after the festival of first fruits, after the feast and the Sabbath of unleavened bread on the 15th of Nisan, that they would begin to partake after their offering to the Most High God as tribute and gratitude for the New Year's crops. After giving the first fruits to God, then, and also giving the Levitical priesthood their share, then after that wave offering, the sheaf offering, where the high priest would wave the barley crop as a sin offering for the nation, Israel, then they would partake of the new crop. And so the new crop had to be ripe and had to be ready for what was the celebration of the day of first fruits. Otherwise, everything would be thrown off. And so that's why it's important that in the observance of Passover and in the observance of unleavened bread and first fruits, that the barley crop has to be ready. Otherwise, everything is thrown off. And so, which if you follow, you know, the vernal equinox and you have the the month and Kadesh, the nearest Kadesh to what is the vernal equinox, then you should be good because that is always the beginning of spring, is right when the sun crosses over the vernal equinox. And so the, the appearance of the waxen crescent that is closest to that, if that is you know when the beginning of um, Nisan occurs, that will more than likely be in tune and in alignment with the the um, the barley crop and the coming of the the spring harvest. All right, continuing Enoch seventy three fourteen. To the moon alone belong in three years, 1,062 days. In five years, it has 50 days less than the sun for an addition being made to the 1,062 days. In five years, there are 1,770 days and the days of the moon in eight years are 2,832 days. So these numbers that Enoch has given you here, you just divide them by 354 and it lets you know that these numbers are according to that particular division and that Enoch is citing them divided by the lunar year. And so in Enoch 73.15, this is the key for understanding that he's speaking about both calendars, the lunar and the solar calendar. For its days and eight years are less than those of the sun by eight days, which eight days are its diminution in eight years. So if you subtract the number of days in the solar year, 364, from the number of days in the corresponding lunar year, 354, one will find that the lunar year has exactly 10 fewer days than the solar year. So in eight years, that diminution would total 80 days, which is exactly what Enoch says in that passage. So he's telling you here that the lunar calendar and the solar calendar are 10 days off. That the lunar calendar being 354 days is 10 days short of the solar year. 
All right, continuing. This is where he summarizes these two calendars, systems and how they work together. Because remember in the Targum, well, I'll read it afterwards again. The year then becomes truly complete according to the station of the moon and the station of the sun, which rise in the different gates, which rise and set in them for 30 days. These are the leaders of the chiefs of the thousands, those which preside over all creation and over all the stars, with the four days which are added and never separated from the place allotted them, according to the complete calculation of the year. And these serve four days which are not calculated in the calculation of the year. What Enoch is talking about here, he says that it takes the sun 30 days to go through each of the six gates of heaven, Back and forth, that would be 180 days. 30 days times 6 is 180 days. And then going back from the Tropic of Capricorn to the Tropic of Cancer, 180 days. And then back is another 180 days. So that's 360 days. And then you have these four days. And these serve four days, which are now calculated in the calculation of the year. Those four days are the two equinoxes and the two solstices. And so adding those four days into it, you get a complete 364-day solar year. I think this is the last portion that I'll read, and then I'll just share commentary. Enoch 74, verse 3. Respecting them men greatly err, for these luminaries truly serve in the dwelling place of the world, one day in the first gate, one in the third gate, one in the fourth gate, and one in the sixth gate. What Enoch is talking about here is the one day in the first gate, that is the winter solstice. The one day in the third gate is the vernal equinox. The one day in the fourth gate is the autumnal equinox. The one day in the sixth gate is the um, the summer solstice and so these are the four days which are not included in the 30 days that it takes for it to go back and forth through these gates of heaven and as i said i decrypt all of this information in great detail in my book flat earth as key to decrypt the book of enoch And the harmony of the world becomes complete every 364th state of it for the signs, the seasons, the years, and the days Uriel showed me the angel whom the Lord of glory appointed over all the luminaries. So Enoch is telling you, you know, how it all unfolds. The only other portion that uh, I'm not going to go into it, but I'll read really quickly is chapter 26, the ministers of heaven, where he goes into the zodiac and the great year, which is the procession of the equinoxes and how it takes 72 um, years to go one degree of the, uh, of the full zodiac. Um, and so he says, and which is interesting in Enoch 74, verses 8 and 9, of heaven, in heaven, and in the world, that they might rule in the face of the sky and appearing over the earth, become conductors of the days and the nights, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the ministers of the heaven, which make their circuit with all the chariots of heaven. And so we see there that the earth is the foundation. The sky, the face of the sky is above the foundation of the earth. And it is the tabernacle of the sun and the other luminaries which are established in the heavens above. This is the last part that I'm going to read. And it's about the zodiac. Thus Uriel showed me 12 gates open for the circuit of the chariots of the sun in heaven from which the rays of the sun shoot forth. From these proceed heat over the earth when they are open in their stated seasons. They are for the winds and the spirits of the dew when 
In their seasons, they are opened, open in heaven at its extremities. Twelve gates I beheld in heaven at the extremities of the earth, through which the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the works of heaven proceed at their rising and setting. Many windows also are open on the right and on the left. One window at a certain season grows extremely hot, so also are these gates from which the stars go forth as they are commanded and in which they set according to their number. I saw likewise the chariots of heaven running in the world above to those gates in which the stars turn, which never set. One of these is greater than all, which goes round. You know, the, when you understand that the timeless photography of the stars over a course of an evening, it shows you that Polaris is the one fixed star and that all of the luminaries are moving in a greater and lesser revolution around its fixed center, that it is the pivot whereby all of the other heavenly luminaries make rotation around it. And so that's how you understand the motions of the sun, the moon, the stars, and the luminaries as it is established in the heavens. I'll, I'll share one other quote with you, if I can find it really quickly. It's from the book, book of Clement, which reading the extra biblical works, it was one of those surprising passages that I found a long time ago, which when you examine it, it tells you in detail about these movements and about these motions. And it reveals to you in great detail that what is described in the book of Enoch as the motions of the sun, the moon, the stars, the other uh, luminaries, that this is exactly what the Most High God is revealing, that it is the luminaries which move in, around, and above the face of the earth, not the other way around, that, you know, we think the earth is moving in circle around the sun, but the earth doesn't move. It does not move with the other luminaries. It is the foundation. So in Clement, it says this, which is one of the more fascinating passages, which is a confirming witness to the book of Enoch. And this is also why, you know, again, in Joshua, Joshua is given the authority to stop the sun and the moon, not the earth and the moon. And if it's the earth rotating in orbit around the sun that causes, you know, it's 24 hour rotation causes the sun to rise and the sun to set. Well, then Joshua would have stopped the earth and not the sun to keep the sun from going down. But he didn't. He stopped the sun and the moon, both of them. You know, and the moon is supposed to be moving around the earth at the same time that the earth is moving around the sun. And yet, you know, when he stopped the sun and the moon, Nothing happened, and if the earth is moving, then you know, how, how does that make any sense? How would it play out? But no, God gave Joshua the authority to move, to stop the sun and the moon, and there were no repercussions. Nothing crazy happened when he gave him that authority. And even when 
Hezekiah is given the sign of the sun going back 10 degrees on the sundial. The sun moved backwards, not the earth. And so this quote also gives you proof of that. And also I would say that the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Vedic cosmology also describes the motions of the sun and the moon and the other stars around Mount Meru, which, you know, like Polaris, is the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north that is spoken about in Isaiah 14. So it says this in First Clement. The heavens are moved by his direction and obey him in peace. Day and night accomplish the course assigned to them by him without hindrance one to another. The sun and the moon and the dancing stars, according to his appointment, circle in harmony within the bounds assigned to them. Without any swerving aside, the earth bearing fruit in fulfillment of his will at her proper seasons, putteth forth the food that supplieth abundantly both men and beasts and all living things which are thereupon making no dissension, neither altering anything which he hath decreed. Moreover, the inscrutable depths of the abyss and the un utterable statues of the nether statutes of the nether regions are constrained by the same ordinances the basin now this is interesting because here the basin of the boundless sea which again the oceans can only be contained if they are held within a basin which is exactly what we see with the circle of the earth it is a, a a concave or concavity, and that the oceans are held within this basin, and then the dry land which juts up past the um, the dry land which juts up past sea level. This is what we see as the habitable part of the world. Okay. The basin of the boundless sea gathered together by his workmanship into its reservoirs passeth not the barriers wherewith it is surrounded, but even as he ordered it, so it doeth. For he said, So far shalt thou come, and thy waves shall be broken within thee. The ocean which is impassable for men and the worlds beyond it are directed by the same ordinances of the master. The seasons of spring and summer and autumn and winter give way in succession one to another in peace. The winds in their several quarters at their proper season fulfill their ministry without disturbance and the ever-flowing fountains created for enjoyment and health without fail give their breasts which sustain the life for men yea the smallest of living things come together in concord and peace all these things the great creator and master of the universe ordered to be in peace and concord doing good unto all things but far beyond the rest unto us who have taken refuge in his compassionate mercies through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory and the majesty forever and ever. Amen. I'll, I'll read one other passage that also confirms this. This is in the Targum version of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. It says, the sun rises by day from the east side and the sun sets on the west side at night and it glides into its place going by the path of the deep and it rises the next day from the place where it rose there yesterday. It goes along the whole south side by the day 
and returns to the north side by the path of the deep. Round and round it goes to the wind of the northern side at the period of Nisan and Tammuz, the vernal equinox and summer solstice, and on its circuit it returns to the wind of the southern side at the period of Tishri and Tibet, which is the autumnal equinox and the winter solstice, which is precise when you understand what it's describing. It goes out from the eastern lattices at dawn and enters through the western lattices in the evening. All the rivers and springs of water continually flow into the water of the ocean, which surrounds the world like a ring, but the ocean is not filled and to the places where the rivers continually flow. They return there in order to flow from the spouts of the deep. I'll read one final thing because this is fascinating. It tells us that the world resembles the ball of his eye. The ocean that encircles the earth is like unto the white of the eye. The dry land is the iris. Jerusalem, the pupil, and the temple, the image mirrored in the pupil of the eye. That's from the legends of the Jews. And so, you know, all these things together, it tells us that God made the circle of the earth. He inscribed it upon the waters of the deep and that this circle was inscribed upon a square. And it is this circle which was covered over by the firmament, the rakia the stereoma, the hard, rigid um, structure of the vaulted dome of the earth. And then the luminaries placed into its tabernacle were given circuit around what is Polaris as the center of that vaulted dome. I'll share with you one last passage. Oh, actually, we don't have time. Maybe. Quickly. And then I made firm the heavenly circle and made that the lower water which is under heaven collect itself together into one whole and that the chaos become dry and it became so. Out of the waves I created rock hard and big and from the rock I piled up the dry and the dry I called earth and the midst of the earth I called the abyss. That is to say, the bottomless. I collected the sea in one place and bound it together with a yoke. And I said to the sea, Behold, I give you your eternal limits, and you shall not break loose from your component parts. And thus I made fast the firmament. This day I called me the first created. And that's the Book of Enoch. All right, God bless all. Until next week. Shalom.